This program provides education, not advice. Sponsors pay a fee for endorsements and interviews. See the truthayf.com disclosure page for details. This is where technology, innovation, and personal finance come together. This is the truth about your future with Rick Edelman. Brought to you by Global X ETFs, dedicated to providing investors with unexplored intelligent solutions, and by Invesco QQQ. Anyone can become an agent of innovation with Invesco QQQ, Invesco Distributors, Inc. It's Friday, June 16th. All this week, I've been sharing with you information about video games. This is a huge industry and a growing source of power and influence, and maybe even espionage. Worldwide, the U.S. produced 17 of the top 20 films last year. China made the other three. Even though China has four times the population we have, we've got 17 of the top 20 movies. But in video games, the U.S. is lagging. Of the top 20 games, they came from nine different countries. Number nine was made in Japan, and it grossed $800 million last year. And that video game, by the way, is only available in Japan. Guess what happens when they make it available worldwide? China made six of the top 20. So you can imagine the incredible influence that the Chinese are having when they're distributing this massively popular series of video games around the world. Developers in the U.S. and Europe who want to sell their games in China, well, they've got to abide by Chinese government rules. For example, the chat function blocks certain words like Taiwan. Developers in other countries also say that when Chinese games go global, the data on the players goes back to the Chinese government. This is the whole TikTok story all over again. Only now we're talking about it as a video game, not a social media platform. And let me ask you this. Are you playing a Chinese-made video game on your phone or on your PC? Yeah. What data is being collected? And how about, consider this, Riot Games or Epic Games, two of the biggest video game producers. They are both owned by Tencent, which is, you guessed it, a Chinese company. You know, Hollywood's got the very same issue, but everybody in Congress goes to the movies. How many members of Congress play video games? We could have a situation where our government legislators, our government regulators, our nation's leaders are not acutely aware of the issue regarding video games, the incredible popularity, the broad global reach, and the fact that most of the biggest selling video games are coming from China. I'm Rick Edelman. We've been talking about video all this week. One of my favorite ETFs in this category is called Hero. That's the symbol, H-E-R-O. It's the Global X Video Gaming ETF. Definitely worth consideration for your diversified portfolio. Get the link in our show notes to GlobalXETFs.com or talk with your financial advisor about it. Support for Rick Edelman's podcast comes from Invesco QQQ. Meet Carmen, an everyday person who likes working in the garden, hosting dinner parties with friends, and listening to live music. She also participates in progress by investing in a fund that supports innovative ideas. Invesco QQQ ETF allows you access to innovators of the NASDAQ 100, so you don't have to be an engineer to help push progress forward. Anyone can become an agent of innovation. Learn more at Invesco.com slash QQQ. There are risks when investing in ETFs, including possible loss of money. ETFs risks are similar to those of stocks. Investments in the tech sector are subject to greater risk and more volatility than more diversified investments. The NASDAQ 100 Index comprises the 100 largest non-financial companies on the NASDAQ. You can't invest directly into an index. Before investing, carefully read and consider fund 
and investment objectives, risks, charges, expenses, and more in prospectus at Invesco.com. Invesco Distributors, Inc. Welcome back to the show. This past week, I hosted the fifth annual Vision Conference in Austin, presented by my company, the Digital Assets Council of Financial Professionals. Vision is the longest-running digital assets investment conference specifically for financial advisors and accredited investors. And this year's conference was our biggest ever. More than 125 financial advisors and investment professionals from all over the country. One of our keynote speakers was Dave Hirsch, chief of the crypto asset and cyber unit in the SEC's Enforcement Division. I spoke with Dave for about an hour on stage, and given the new enforcement actions that the SEC has filed against Binance and Coinbase, I wanted to share that entire conversation with you today. Here it is, unabridged and uncensored. Let me, uh, uh, with great pleasure, uh, invite up here to join me Uh, David Hirsch, he is the uh, head of the SEC's uh, Crypto Enforcement Division, um, who flew in from uh, Washington to join us today. Um, And so please give a warm welcome to Dave Hirsch. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for joining us, David. Of course. Thank you. David, as you know, I told you yesterday that David can't take questions off the fly from the audience, so uh, you submitted questions um, in advance, uh, and David has reviewed those and has um, agreed to answer most of them. Uh, and there are, there are a few wacky questions you submitted, let's admit it. Um, so uh, I'll mention those just because they were fun and wacky. but. Uh, We'll skip all those. So uh, as a prelude, uh, David, uh, and, and thank you so much for joining us uh, for this event. You know, it's, it's really vitally important that um, government um, be responsive and open communicative with, uh, uh, with citizens, and, and that is one of the things that we love about uh, this country. So let me just ask, um, uh, first off, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so b- before I before I get into that, I first have to acknowledge that uh, al- although I'm I'm and it sounds like I will definitely need to emphasize this multiple times throughout my talk. But uh, while I'm here today in my official capacity, the views that I'm going to share are those uh, of my own only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the commission, the commissioners, or my fellow members of the staff. So with that disclaimer out of the way. What we are attempting to do is establish and require a uniform set of expectations and requirements for everyone who is selling securities to investors. And that there is a uh, one set of expectations, which is if you're going to be taking money from investors, if you are offering a product with speculative benefits, if people are buying your product with the expectation that they are going to receive more money from having owned it as a result of something that the promoter, the issuer, the developer, or some other discrete group of people are doing, that falls under the securities laws in the U.S. under the 1946 case Howey and its progeny, and we can talk more about that, but that whether that is uh, an instrument that is referenced on a blockchain or on some uh, issuer's uh, internal ledgers or sold through a transfer agent, it, it's the same set of rules. It's the same set of expectations, which is if you're going to be issuing a security, you either need to register or satisfy an exemption that releases you from the obligation to exemption. And, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Let me take a little quick step back, though, because you, you're not a career SEC uh, employee. You've only been with the agency a few years now. Uh, you, you were here in Texas um, before moving to uh, Washington. Talk about your journey through crypto because you know, nobody grew up in crypto. Uh, it's all too new. So talk about how you got involved in crypto and led you uh, to joining the SEC. Sure, absolutely. So I've been with the SEC since uh, 2015, late 2015. I joined here in Texas in the Fort Worth Regional Office. 
Prior to that, I was a practicing attorney for several years, and then I left to start my own private investigation business with a good friend from law school, which we ran and operated for 10 years. So I had 10 years plus where I was a small business person struggling with all the things that all small business people struggle with, like what licenses do I need? What regulators control me? How do I navigate banking and financing relationships? And so I think that experience, that entrepreneurial experience, and we grew to be about a 12 person shop, so we were never huge, but you had employees, you had HR, you had IT, you had all the things you need to do to run a business. And I think for me, that was very instructive in how I approach my work at the SEC. The SEC has a three part mission. Protect investors, ensure fair and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. In enforcement, which is where I work in the SEC, we tend to focus on protecting investors and, and market integrity more than the third prong, which is facilitate capital formation. But when I joined the SEC and, and in the work I do every day, I always keep that third prong in mind, having lived the life of an entrepreneur. Facilitating capital formation is one of the things that makes this country great, and it's one of the obligations of the SEC, and so it's a balance that we always have to pursue. And you're not, um, you're a young guy, you're not, um I think going to spend a career at the SEC. You, that's right. you know, you came in the midst of your career, and this is a—I won't call it a way station. That's not quite right, but you're going to move on at some point. Um, is government for service generally your future, or will you go back to the private sector? I think time will tell. Um, I'm a relatively ambitious person, like I think we all are, and so traditionally in my career path, I've thought about the job I have, and also about what. I would want to do next. Less so when I was running my own business, because that seemed like a, a marathon at a sprint pace that had no beginning or middle or end. But every other job I've had, I've thought about, like, how is this job going to prepare me? What is it I want to do next? And what things should I be doing in this job to, to prepare me for that? This is the first job I've had in a long time that has no element of that. I'm uh, the chief of the crypto asset and cyber unit within the division of enforcement at the SEC. It's a huge job. It's a very big team. We interact with um, industry, with academics, with fellow regulators, criminal and civil, uh, and just does not really afford me significant time to think about what's next and isn't really the right way, I think, for me to try and do this job because it might lead me to make decisions that are more in my future professional interest than in the interest of the people I'm trying to serve. So really enjoying my government service time. I think it's fair to say it's probably not forever, at least in my current capacity. This is a very intense job. Uh, crypto is active. Uh, we are active in crypto, and that's not necessarily done at a pace that is sustainable for decades, but uh, really, I've only been in the job since October, and while I joke about it being five dog years since then, it's, uh, it's a really fun job and one I want to keep doing for a good long time. So I, I wanted to provide just a little bit of the humanity uh, behind this, that this is a, you, you've got a wife and, and children, um, and uh, so I just want to provide a little bit of humanity as I go back to my question of what the hell are you doing? Um, why is the SEC engaged in crypto in the first place? Uh, I mean, the SEC doesn't, you're not paying any attention to comic books, uh, comic book dealers or gold dealers. Um, why the focus on crypto? So for me at the SEC, I got into crypto in 2015 right when I joined the agency. I, uh, when my private investigation business was no longer growing in a way that I wanted it to, and I was looking for my next opportunity, I applied at the SEC in Fort Worth. I was hired, and there's like a very sensible month to six week period between when they give you the offer and when they let you set foot in the door while they run through your security background and otherwise. And so during that time, I reached out to what would soon be my manager and said, I've been out of the full-time practice of law for some time while I was running this private investigation business. Like, I want to hit the ground running. What should I be preparing for? And she said, well, I think the skills you have as an investigator will translate to the things you're going to be doing as an enforcement attorney, so I'm not too worried about that. But are you interested in Bitcoin at all? We have a bunch of cases involving Bitcoin. I said, sure, no, very interested in Bitcoin. That sounds great. And then went to Google and said, what is Bitcoin? <laughs> so in other words, uh, in other words, as a lawyer, uh, you did what lawyers do, you lied. Well, <laughs> I had interest in Bitcoin. I was a uh, avid reader of Wired magazine and other technology magazines. I had paid attention to it, but I had never engaged in a deep dive. And so uh, maybe- and Ethereum, uh, Ethereum was just coming out in yeah. 2015. Yeah, so maybe embellish rather than lie, but <laughs> similar, similar paths. So, and then early on, the cases that we were looking at originally were 
old fraud, new wrapper. So we were looking at the types of offering frauds we see in all sorts of areas, but now with the miracle of blockchain being the thing that was going to generate outsized profits or was going to allow people to deliver 100% monthly returns or all of the other things we see in some of the offering frauds, it seemed deeply problematic. It was also the era, era just post Silk Road where there was still a lot of activity investments and otherwise dark web and otherwise people were using Bitcoin as a anonymity, uh, anonymity providing device that they would transact in Bitcoin that made it harder to trace them. And in that era, it very much did. Like we did not at that time have commercial or in-house attribution and tracing software. So I would go to blockchain explorers and download the series of transactions where I thought might contain things of interest and put them into Excel and then just bang away on pivot tables and otherwise trying to figure it out. And I spent that time because people were losing real money. Investors were being harmed. And also because I recognized at the time, this may not be the size that this thing grows to. And we need to be ready to protect investors and markets should this thing continue to grow. And I've been telling this story lately because I think it is uh, both ridiculous but also somewhat indicative of where my head was at at the time is I went to my, like the senior most leader in that office to get approval to continue pursuing these investigations. And I was very candid with him, uh, I guess unloyally in that regard, uh, and said, I don't know that these will ever turn into cases. Like we are uh, under-resourced from a technology perspective. We're just learning what we're doing. Uh, it's very difficult for us to attribute conduct. So I can see that a transaction happened. I can trace it back to a specific address. I don't yet have a great way to identify the person behind the keyboard who was executing that transaction and who ultimately bears accountability for that conduct. But we need to get there because right now these are two and $5 million problems. And God forbid five years from now, they could be $100 million problems. I was off by like multiple uh, levels of magnitude. Like these are multi- The FTX was 60 billion. Yeah, these are huge, huge uh, organizations and offerings and ecosystems at times. And so we are involved in crypto because that's where investors are putting their money. We are involved there because- Well, but no, that's not in, in and of itself, David, necessarily fair because just because a lot of people are investing in something isn't of itself a reason to engage. Gold's market is multiple times bigger than the crypto market. You're not going after gold dealers. That's correct. We are not the, we are neither the worldwide investment police, nor are we the United States uh, universal investment police. We are jurisdictionally bounded to look after securities markets and securities investments. And so the distinction between gold, as you mentioned, and some other investments is, we are focused on those areas where crypto assets bleed over into the securities markets. And the way we assess whether or not we have jurisdiction, whether we have that connection between the instrument or the service being provided and our jurisdiction, securities markets, is a couple of tests. One is the Howey test, which I alluded to earlier, which you likely may have heard about, but it's an investment of money in a common enterprise with an expectation of profits based on the efforts of a third party. And the idea is if you as an investor are giving your money to somebody else with the idea that it is going to turn into more money because of something that they are going to do or something that some other identifiable third party is going to do. So you're basically taking a passive uh, position with the idea that other people are going to honor what they've indicated they plan to do and in the process will make you more money. They take on additional obligations. We, we treat that as a securities offering and absent an exemption when you are the person doing the promoting and doing the issuing. It's not the same thing as just trying to sell a par product to somebody. You're now taking their money and they're expecting to get something bigger back in return because of your efforts. That won't always be successful. Investments fail, we recognize that but it does create additional obligations on the part of the person who's taking the money. Like the, the obligations of a business person who seeks outside financing to those people who are providing the financing is different than the obligations they owe to themselves as a single party. But if that's the case, then you're trying to, or not trying, you are making the determination um, independently through your own office that X out there is a security and you're going to um, hold them accountable for not having registered as a security. Um, but they 
maybe beginning from a premise where they dispute the fact that they need to be a security, and that's where the butting of heads comes in. Th that is true, and, and there is a established and effective method for resolving those disputes, and that's our judicial system, that we do not ultimately determine what is or isn't a security, but we do have uh, the authority and the obligation uh, from Congress, from the securities laws, to carry out our mission, to protect investors and markets. And so, in doing so, we first have to establish jurisdiction. We have to decide, is this an area that the SEC should be allocating resources to? Is this where our mission takes us? And we have to make our best assessment about that. And the people who we are seeking to regulate may say, no, we disagree. We are outside the regulatory envelope. And if we are not able to reach a resolution informally, and often we can, we reach settlements with people all the time, but if we can't, if we think you're a security and you think you're not, then we have to go to court and then let the judges decide And that. so one of the, the paths that this has uh, wandered, uh, meandered through uh, the past couple of years is that the SEC has complained that some of these organizations are engaging in the sale of unregistered securities, and you have said, or you, the agency, has said, we want you to register. Um, the complaint, though, from the crypto community is that, okay, fine, and the example that, that seems to be most uh, significant here uh, are the Bitcoin ETFs. The Bitcoin, uh, there have been 40 plus applications of uh, fund companies, um, some of whom are in the exhibit hall next door, uh, who have attempted, uh, who have filed applications, only to be rejected. So on the one hand, the SEC is saying, we're unhappy with you for not registering, and then on the other hand, rejecting the registration applications. It seems like it's heads I win, tails you lose. We can't have it both ways. So the issue as to whether or not a spot Bitcoin ETF should be approved is presently in litigation in the DC District Court. And so I'm limited in what I can talk about because I don't want to impact that litigation in any way. That is properly before the court and we are going to make our arguments in court. As to globally, the idea of sometimes people want to register things and are disappointed that uh, we determine that they have not yet satisfied their burden of establishing that this is a market that's subject to adequate surveillance or that this is an instrument that is sufficiently exempt from manipulation is a kind of a facts and circumstances based analysis. And I think the fact that we're in court is probably supportive of the functioning of the system or is indicative of a functioning system where we have a dispute. We say, we don't think you've satisfied the legal burden you have to meet in order to be able to register this product. The entities that are trying to promote the products disagree with us, and one of them have said, we can't resolve this directly. We have not been able to resolve this directly, so let's put it in front of a court and let the court decide. We have approved other Bitcoin exchange-traded products that are based on futures, and the distinction we've drawn is because there, there's a Chicago Mercantile Exchange or other established registered trading venues for those instruments and that that provides the necessary level of surveillance that the spot products don't have to offer. Which is counterintuitive, right? Because you've approved a product based on a derivative, but you won't approve the product based on the product. And that just doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, and, and I think that is part of the argument that is in front of the court. And so we'll see what the court has to say about that. I, mean, I think we're doing our best to interpret the rules as they have been written and apply them. Or but is there a, uh, any other motivation or reasoning in the SEC's thinking uh, emanating from starting with the chair uh, as to uh, why there is not uh, acceptance of a Bitcoin ETF? It seems to me that this is not a black and white issue. This is a judgment call. You could say yes to a Bitcoin ETF if you wanted to. I could not. Not my department. The SEC <laughs> could say yes to a Bitcoin ETF if it wanted to. I think that is probably right. I think they probably could. Um, and so I think, but I also, we all work incredibly long hours. I assume that's a given for everybody who's here on their free time trying to learn more about a complex area. Um, I am in that crowd, the people in the SEC are in that crowd, like we work 
very long hours. We're very committed to the mission. I've never had one of my colleagues say, I would like to spend an extra eight or 10 hours working this week on something just because it's my personal preference for how things should work. The people I go to work with every day, virtually and in person, are deeply committed to the betterment of American investors and markets. And I think to the extent they think that this product, or they say publicly this product hasn't satisfied the base legal requirements for approval, it's because they sincerely believe that. I can understand how a court could come to a different conclusion. I can understand how the application of our rules in some ways can seem anomalous when looked at in isolated circumstances, and that's a good time to, to go to court and say, hey, I think this is coming from a good place, but we just disagree with where you came out. Sometimes the uh, concern about lawyers, I'm not one, so I can, you know, it's always, we can tell lots of lawyer jokes if you like. No, that's right. You know any good ones? Not good ones. No. <laughs> um, I do, I know a lot of good lawyer jokes. Um, the, um, the problem that often occurs with lawyers is that they focus on the law, they're so focused on let's get it right, that they sometimes lose sight of the practical implications of what it is they're doing. Let me, let me give you a daisy chain scenario and tell me your thoughts of this that you begin with the premise that the agency isn't convinced that the Bitcoin ETF applications are approvable within the uh, rules, kind of what you just said, right? Raise your hand if you would recommend a Bitcoin ETF to a client if it were available in the marketplace. All the industry surveys of financial advisors reflect that same result. Virtually every hand went up, as you saw. Uh, according to the, uh, now this is of course a little bit of a bias group. This is a group of financial advisors who are attending a crypto conference. Naturally, <laughs> you would see that. But even in, in other industry surveys, more generally of financial advisors, uh, the last one I saw was 77% of financial advisors said they are not recommending crypto to clients because there is not a Bitcoin ETF. We all know the ETF marketplace. ETFs are the most popular, favored uh, investment vehicle. They're low cost, they're transparent, they're liquid, um, uh, they're highly diversified. And, and so that is the, the favored, most common uh, vehicle, as, as you know. Uh, and the absence of a Bitcoin ETF is keeping lots of financial advisors on the sidelines in the crypto space. Um, as a result of financial advisors not engaging in crypto because there isn't a Bitcoin ETF, um, that is, the result of that is that when a client calls their advisor and says, what do you think about Bitcoin? The advisor is forced to say, sorry, can't help you because there isn't an investment vehicle that my firm will let me use because there are no Bitcoin ETFs out there. That doesn't dissuade the client from investing in Bitcoin. It dissuades the client from investing in Bitcoin via the advisor. So the client goes out on their own to buy it um, independently. Um, we know that m many consumers are not very good at the investment world. That's why there is so much fraud and abuse. Uh, and it's because the advisors and the clients aren't able to work together. So is it possible that an unintended side effect of the SEC's refusal to accept the registration applications of Bitcoin ETF providers, that you're actually, result, the result is, clients are actually being harmed rather than helped because the most popular product is being denied to them and interfering in their ability to get the advice they want from advisors. Is that potential daisy chain scenario that perhaps you folks are not paying a lot of attention to? So again, because this is subject to litigation, I'm uh, walking a delicate path here uh, as to what I can say and, and what would you know, potentially get in front of the judge or get in front of, more importantly, my litigators who are making the best arguments on behalf of the agency and, and responding to the arguments being made by the opposing counsel. I, I have a couple of thoughts about that personally. Again, these are all my personal views. I mentioned I was going to be repeating that. I'm, it appears I'm going to be repeating that a lot. Um, I think that that is a potential that 
if there is no approved uh, Bitcoin ETF, that there are people who will, instead of recommending a Bitcoin futures ETP, will just say, I can't help you because my, and so there are some small subgroup of investors, therefore, who will not buy a Bitcoin ETF. Presumably, it's some even smaller subgroup of that will then go out to try and find how they go about buying Bitcoin directly, and some smaller group than that may suffer some detriment as a result. It's not a that. very small group. The FBI says 46,000 Americans lost a billion dollars over the past two years to Bitcoin or crypto frauds. A lot of those folks, because they went directly on their own, searching on the internet and getting caught up in Lord knows what, um, as opposed to being able to be served by their financial advisors. It's not a small subset, David. We're talking about a huge number of people. I, I, what I don't know is the percentage of people who would otherwise buy an ETF who instead, like first go and find a financial professional and say, I would like to buy this thing. And when that is unavailable, would then go out and buy something that's dramatically risky or that, or that are therefore in the cohort who lose money to crypto frauds. Because crypto frauds, it's extremely broad. Like that is well beyond Bitcoin. True. Um, there's a, a lot of rug pulls and other things that are separate and apart from that. And I think the thing that we have said in our denials has been there is not an adequate system of surveillance that is comparable to trading on a registered exchange. It seems to me that a business that wanted to try and establish that Bitcoin is sufficiently resistant to manipulation might be able to accumulate data that would satisfy that criteria, that issue that we have pointed out is like an inadequate, inadequate level of surveillance. We haven't seen that necessarily, or at least we have deemed whatever we got back is not adequate to establish adequate surveillance. But I, that's one of the things that we are motivated by is to what extent could this instrument be subject to manipulation and that would therefore expose a large group of investors to a shared harm experience. But it almost sounds a little reminiscent of prohibition in the 30s. Um, that didn't stop people from drinking. It just chased them into speakeasies where they drank rot gut at very expensive prices. Um, are you sure that denial of a Bitcoin ETF is the best way to protect investors as opposed to accepting a Bitcoin ETF, which gives you the regulatory oversight by having them under the tent of SEC jurisdiction. It gives you regulatory oversight of that issuer, but not over the market overall. And we but, don't claim surveillance or direct supervision or regulatory oversight over Bitcoin. But isn't it better to at least bring some under the tent because there would be a huge number of consumers who would obtain the Bitcoin ETF to satisfy their desire to gain exposure to the asset class. As, and less likely, therefore, to fall victim to the frauds and abuses that exist, especially through the engagement and involvement. I mean, if Merrill Lynch ran an ad saying, we'll provide you with a Bitcoin ETF, a lot of people who might otherwise go to shady organizations will be very happy to go to a big brand name like Schwab or Fidelity or Invesco or Global X, as opposed to Lord knows who that they've never heard of because they're willing to give them a product that the established brands won't. So are we sure that we're serving investors the best way possible, that maybe we, we need to choose priorities a little bit different, that although it's an imperfect world, that it perhaps price uh, uh, transparency isn't ideal, the alternative is worse? I mean, that is a policy consideration that I'm confident our commissioners are making and that our policy divisions are making. I am uh, relegated to the division of enforcement, and so I tend to get involved when somebody has broken a clear rule or I'm uh, concerned they may have broken a clear rule. So it's possible. I mean, I, I can't say where that trade-off is. I've not done the analysis. It has not been on my uh, plate somewhat happily. I'm happy to stay outside of the policy realm because it's really challenging. Um, and because I don't know that there are great, clear answers. Like what you said is true, potentially. Like let's, let's credit you and say, yes, if Merrill Lynch came out and they offered one, that there'd be a huge upswing in adoption. And some portion of that adoption would probably be better served because they were gonna adopt anyway and you'd rather have them outside the speakeasy and into a, a licensed 
uh, pub or regulated uh, place to, to buy alcohol, where there's hopefully some greater degree of scrutiny over things, though limited, you know, still don't control the market overall for Bitcoin, don't have universal views into it and whether it is subject to manipulation here or abroad. But also, you're gonna have some group who are like, oh, well, let's take happy hour down to the pub. I was never gonna go into a speakeasy, but as long as there's this brightly lit pub, maybe I'll go in there. And so you have some group that's going to be exposed to, to the extent that Bitcoin is subject to manipulation, you're gonna have some additional group of investors who are open to potentially more harm than they otherwise might have experienced. Yeah, but now you've got the role of the advisor as the gatekeeper suitability rules, fiduciary standards that are going to be in place, as with every other asset class, to help protect the investor from investing who shouldn't invest, from investing more than they should invest, properly managing that investment through rebalancing, tax loss harvesting, dollar cost averaging, and so on. Wouldn't it be better to have the financial advisory community engaged in the crypto market than excluded? Because that's how pretty much everybody's feeling right now. They're excluded. Yeah, I, I think adding layers of expertise and professionalism to investing is uh, very beneficial. And so to the extent that decisions we make uh, interfere with that, that is on the debit ledger, debit side of the ledger of, but in the way that the rules are written, like that is not one of the criteria. And so I don't know if that's a rule writing problem or a Congress problem, but the way that the criteria are developed for what ETFs can be approved looks very much at the underlying instrument itself. So in this case, Bitcoin, and whether it is subject to adequate surveillance to like give us confidence that it's not subject to, and, and the fact that you could have additional levels of confidence short of adequate surveillance, I think is an improvement, but it doesn't address the ultimate issue that's in the rule itself. So would you be willing to commit to this group that you'll take back this uh, concept to your colleagues at the agency when you return to Washington. 100%, happy. The, 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 the reason I'm here, and uh, it's at some personal risk is probably the stronger, too strong a word, but being out and speaking candidly um, is I think part of my responsibility working for government, trying to share the views and, and give you some insights into where we are coming from and the way we are approaching these issues. But I also have to be careful that there's a lot of great work being done and I'm not aware of all of it, I'm not keyed into all of it. A lot of it exists well outside of my purview or areas of expertise and don't wanna speak for anybody else. But being willing to bring messages back from, from market, from investors, from investment professionals, from developers and, and other professionals, like I consider that to be core to my function, is that I can help provide a coordinating function. I have um, probably more confidence and optimism about the technology than some in government, uh, as far as underlying blockchain and digital asset technology. I just recognize it can't be, and doesn't need to be in my mind, developed at the expense of the same levels of investor protection and market integrity protections that exist for other types of investments in this country. As you know, yesterday uh, we had a long conversation about uh, Binance and Coinbase and the recent enforcement actions. A um, few questions regarding sure. that. Um, first, uh, in the Coinbase case particularly, there were 13 securities. There was a bunch of others in the Binance uh, case. 13, uh, not securities, 13 coins that the SEC is complaining are un unregistered securities and you're taking to task Coinbase for uh, buying and selling, trading those securities uh, on their platform. What was really notable is that neither Bitcoin nor Ethereum were on that list. Struck us as conspicuous in their absence. So the chair has been out publicly, um, I think since his confirmation hearing uh, a couple years ago, saying that he does not view Bitcoin as a security, but that he's got questions about everything else. Um, I would not focus too much on addition by subtraction or by looking and focusing on those things that we did not include. We typically aren't going to allege anything as a security until we have both conducted a full investigation and come to the conclusion that it appears to be an unregistered security, and more importantly, our five-person commission has voted on that. Like, I can think whatever I want, and it has zero impact on the world outside until the commission has decided to authorize some sort of action. 
so I would not be so focused on what isn't on the list and, and think more about what is on the list and even other things that are on the list, all we need to do to establish jurisdiction over Coinbase's conduct in our view is to establish that they've been in the business of transacting in at least one security, unregistered or otherwise. And if they are transacting in securities and they're performing the functions of a broker, of a clearing agency that takes money uh, from one party and, and hands it to the other and takes a token from one party and gives it to the other, classic clearing agency conduct, or acting as an exchange where they're bringing together buyers and sellers to match them on a non-discretionary basis, typically based on price than time. Those are all traditional market functions that require registration, separate registration. You have to register as a broker, you have to register as an exchange, you have to register as a clearing agency, and there are rules about how much overlap you can have on those functions. And the rules are there to reduce conflicts of interest, to better position investors, and to enhance accountability. And traditionally, there has been some degree of competition, where if you're a broker, you're not going to want to route your client's transactions to a shady exchange. Like if you don't have confidence that that exchange has legitimate listing requirements and is in compliance with its self-regulatory organization and its larger regulatory obligations and is handling its business in an appropriate way and, and uh, surveilling for manipulative trading and otherwise keeping a clear book, like if you're a broker, why would I route my transactions there? I'd rather route them to a legitimate and registered exchange. And similarly, if you're an exchange, you're not gonna wanna have your transactions cleared by an unreliable clearing agency. People are gonna get mad at you. They're gonna come sue you. It's gonna be bad. And like when you collapse all those functions under one roof, you give up on that level of competition. You no longer have brokers looking out for conflicts and exchanges and exchanges looking out for conflicts of but within that context, it's interesting that you know, one of the 13 coins on the list was Solana, just to pick an example. Uh, why sue Coinbase for selling Solana as, a, uh, as an unregistered security as opposed to suing the Solana Foundation for issuing Solana in the first place? It, 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 it strikes me as very reminiscent of the share class uh, scenario where the SEC allows mutual fund companies to issue B shares and C shares and then goes after financial advisors who sell B shares and C shares. What, if you're going to allow the product to be manufactured, what's the problem with using the product in business? So what we have alleged against Coinbase in regards to Solana is unregistered broker activity, unregistered clearing activity, unregistered exchange activity. We have not alleged that they violated the law, which is Section 5 of the 1933 Act, uh, Securities Act. We have not alleged that Coinbase violated the law by issuing or offering or selling Solana under the Section 5. We have alleged that they were performing exchange functions, and that would be true whether it's uh, Solana as a security or any of the other tokens or securities. We just need to identify those things that we think are securities in order to establish our jurisdictional hook. But wouldn't that start with the issuer? Why not go after Solana first rather than Coinbase? Coinba Coinbase can't be selling a coin that doesn't exist, so if the, if the coin is unregistered, why not go after the issuer? We retain the, the, the right and the jurisdiction to allege that Solana or anybody else who we think are issuing unregistered securities violated Section 5 in doing so. There are... So you're suggesting that Solana is your next target? Not, certainly not uh, previewing any... Uh, we don't use the word target. Uh, that's a DOJ use, but... <laughs> DOJ word, but... Not, not, I'm not previewing who else might be on our uh, list of people to speak with uh, at all. But I am saying that... But it's conceivable that um, filing uh, enforcement cases against issuers is on your list of potential to-dos. It has been on our list, it remains on our list. We, we recently won a case against Library, we brought a case against Kraken for an unregistered offering relating to their staking as a service project. Like we are pursuing claims for the unregistered offer and sale of securities, whether that's by you know, an issuer or an uh, intermediary that's providing a service like that. We, we did allege that Coinbase through their staking as a service product are violating Section 5. This is about different sections of the Securities Code where basically 
they are offering exchange functions. And in order for us to have jurisdiction over that, we have to establish that there's a security on their platform. So there's a, a conspiracy theory that the uh, reason that the SEC is going after Coinbase, as opposed to Solana Foundation, is that Coinbase is a big, prominent company, uh, 100 million accounts, um, reportedly, uh, multi-billion dollar revenue business. And by going after Coinbase, uh, the goal is, this is the conspiracy theory, the goal is to shut down Coinbase uh, and use this as a way to discourage uh, investors and consumers from engaging in crypto as part of their investment uh, strategy. Um, and by extension, uh, driving cr the crypto industry out of the US. Coinbase has already said that they're uh, talking with London. Uh, they've already established licenses in, in other countries. Um, other Gemini is doing the same thing. Uh, Bittrex has shut down its US operations. Uh, Anderson Horowitz has announced they're opening a London office for crypto startups, which they previously have done in San Francisco. Is the SEC trying to get the digital assets industry out of the US? No. Uh, we are not trying to get the digital assets industry out of the US. We are trying does, to hold- Does the agency realize that that might be a byproduct of its actions? Our view is, my view personally is, it's probably a better way to phrase it, because um, these are my personal views. Um, allowing a liquid, fully functioning financial system to exist in parallel with our regulated financial system is perilous in my mind. I think it is eroding of trust for those players within the digital asset space and, and those people in a larger financial space who take seriously their compliance obligations and their regulatory obligations. It would be, I have had people come to me and say, in this role and in prior roles, I would like to do things the right way. I would like to come and have the consultations with the SEC and get feedback and hire the lawyers and the accountants and the auditors. They might not have mentioned liking hiring auditors, but they recognize that's one of their obligations. They, they want to do things the right way and be regulated and be compliant. And unfortunately for them, they feel like they're at a 40% plus economic disadvantage if they choose to go that route because they are going to be competing against people who can set up shop next door, reach liquid markets immediately, and start making revenue day one without any regard for incurring those extra costs or taking the extra time to try and do things the right way. And so if you allow large industry-spanning players to continue to act in a way that we believe to be non-compliant with the regulatory obligations. What we are saying to those folks who want to do things the right way is you're, to do so is already a difficult path and now you're at a significant additional disadvantage. And that does not seem like a proper way to promote a fully functioning financial system in this country and I think it creates additional risk, which is crypto, although it takes a lot of oxygen and bandwidth within the SEC and certainly within my group, it takes almost all of it, um, it's only a small part of what we do. There's $115 trillion capital markets that the SEC oversees. And if you reduce the regulatory obligations for a particular sector, if you say, well, crypto, you built everything non-compliantly and now it would be too expensive or too difficult to do the work to retrofit it and make it compatible with our regulatory system, or you don't want to go out and create new versions of what you've built that would be regulatorily compliant, that's fine, you can have a lower burden. I mean, what does that say to ExxonMobil and the other huge issuers in this country and the stock exchanges and everybody else about their willingness to continue to engage with us and honor their legal and regulatory obligations? Why wouldn't I just create a token, sell that without any oversight, hope for the best, and reduce my costs today. I think well, but, and that's interesting because there are a lot of tokens being issued. Uh, Starbucks is issuing tokens as part of its loyalty rewards. Nike is issuing NFTs uh, and selling them in the marketplace. You you have a 16 year old son Ike who plays on uh, plays Roblox, and uh, he buys Robuxes, um, which is the Roblox digital uh, token. At what point is the SEC going to say Robux is a security? Uh, 
Nike's NFTs are securities, Starbucks' loyalty rewards are securities. Is that the daisy chain that we're going to see following next? I don't think that's a daisy chain, but I think it is with any of those things. It is not the fact that you've created it that determines whether or not it's a security. It's not the entity that creates it. It's not the fact of its existence. It's the economic, and it's not what you call it, it's the underlying economic reality that would determine whether or not we would we'd take a look. So Moving if, back to the Howey test. Getting back to the Howey test. So if Robux, for instance, uh, big venture capital funds were buying up billions of dollars in Robux with the intent that they're going to resell them into the market at a profit. Um, the, the use of Robux is minuscule compared to the financial transactions, the speculative conduct, the trading of Robux, that the people who buy Robux primarily do so with the idea that it, they're, if they just hold on to it, it'll be worth more in the future because of all the great work Robux is doing to make theirs a popular platform. Well, now that starts to look a lot more like a, an investment and a security and less like a, a analogous payment system to the US dollar. So if you set your costs at a fixed amount so that people who are buying your token know that they're doing so because they can only use it on their platform, but you're divorcing it from the speculative intent that is present in so much of digital assets, I don't think you're going to be getting a phone call from us or be much less likely. The, the times when people run afoul of the SEC laws are when they are offering investments without going through the process of either qualifying for an exemption or satisfying the regulatory obligation by registering. You've acknowledged that some of the uh, decision making at the SEC is based not necessarily on the letter of the law, um, but on the SEC's uh, interpretation or judgment on that law. For example, you mentioned that uh, SEC Chair Gary Gensler has long held the view that Bitcoin is not a security um, and that virtually all the others um, probably are. Um, at one point, uh, there was a wide acceptance that uh, Ethereum was not a security, but its transfer from proof of work to proof of stake has caused some in the agency to revisit that question uh, as to whether G is it a security after all. Um, so some of this is uh, judgment and viewpoint, clearly. Uh, last week on CNBC, the, the chairman made the following statement. He said, we don't need more digital currency. I equate that to the chair of the FAA saying, we don't need any more airlines. Why would the chair of the SEC be in a position to determine what the marketplace needs? So a couple things there. First, I would, I think, take mild issue with the idea that we don't always take action based on the letter of the law, that everything we do has to fit within the letter of the law. But within that umbrella, we have finite resources. And so we have to make allocation decisions. We have to make prioritization decisions. But at no point do I think any of my colleagues say, this is outside the letter of the law, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's just not a conversation I've ever heard. I would be appalled if that happened. That's not, not the way we approach our jobs. As to what the chair said, and that's my boss's boss, maybe boss's boss's boss, so I'm reluctant to um, get too involved in trying to interpret what was said in a live television interview. Uh, I've had some time speaking with him. My view of kind of what I think he was trying to communicate, but again, I wouldn't want to speak for him. He's much more accomplished than I am, is he views the world often through economic terms. And he has talked on prior interviews, including on CNBC, I think, about the kind of old wildcat currency days of the 1800s, where lots of people, lots of banks were issuing their own script. They would each have their own dollars, and those would be popular for a time, but typically had no staying power. Eventually, the, the US dollar won out because of economies of scale, because of reliability, because of trust, because of lots of conditions. And people who were left holding a wildcat script were probably worse off for having done so. There wasn't really a use case for it. It didn't make economic sense. But that's sense. kind of the point, isn't it? This, the market solved this issue. Well, I think that in his conversation, he was trying to say, I don't see a use case. We don't need because there is not a market purpose for a currency that exists only to replicate the US dollar, but to do so digitally. Because so much of what we can do with the, di with the dollar can already be done digitally. So it doesn't make economic business sense, but we are merit neutral. Like I would not tell anybody don't 
create a new digital product. It's not my place to say. In fact, I would say part of my job is to facilitate that if you can do it in a way that is consistent with investor protection and market integrity protection. So, so you're, you're walking back the chairman's comments. I'm not bit. walking back the chairman's comments. I'm attempting to, <laughs> attempting to uh, interpret it based on context I have from other things I've heard him say, but he may well have meant it as he said it. I've also heard him say multiple times, we are merit neutral, we don't, so that leads me to think that it wasn't his intent to say we are suddenly not merit neutral, which could be one interpretation of the words as quoted, but I would not, uh, I'm not here to, to tell you what he meant. That's certainly his job. Um, we have a few minutes left, and, and one of the things I want to uh, deviate from uh, our conversation on crypto, if uh, okay with you all, is that uh, what um, doesn't get a lot of attention uh, for you, Dave, uh, because there's so much focus on crypto, gets all the headlines, um, it's the sexy subject, if nothing else, is the other half of your job title. Uh, it's not just crypto asset enforcement, it's cyber, generally, cybersecurity. That is a huge deal as well. Uh, and financial advisors are you know, right at, at ground zero of dealing this because we're, all of our clients' assets are held online and we're dealing with online you know, apps and, uh, and so on. And so talk about what else is going on in your world that is uh, very germane and relevant to financial advisors in the world of cybersecurity. I appreciate that, and, and that's right. Like, Crypto does take up a lot of oxygen, particularly over the last five or six months. But cyber is a huge part of what we do, what my unit and my team does. Um, and it's of pressing importance. I'm often asked to speak on it almost as much as crypto, which sometimes surprises me because crypto is so much in the national conversation. But the way I think about cyber is it is a universal constraint for all of us. It's a universal consideration. Like you have to opt into crypto. You have to decide that I want to be involved in this space and I want to take some of the risks that are associated with it. All of us are automatically opted in to, to cyber. It's going to impact all of us. And so we are really active in trying to ensure that cyber regulations are there to protect investors and markets. And we look at it through basically two prisms. The first is our registrant community. So if you're a registered investment advisor, you're a broker dealer, you're a self-regulatory organization, an exchange, or somebody else who registers with us, then you have certain obligations to try and protect the personally identifiable information and the assets of the people who trust their, their assets with you, who work with you. And then on the issuer side, we are less about those kind of policies and procedures that we require you to take on, like Reg SID and Reg SCI and some of the other kind of computer protection rules, and more about your policies and procedures have to be reflective of your lived risk experience. You have to follow your policies and procedures, whatever they may be, and you have to disclose to investors accurate and timely material information when it comes to your possession. We brought a case maybe about three or four months ago called Blackbaud, involving a, um, publicly traded company that existed to help service folks in the nonprofit world. And originally they came out and said, you know, we've been subject to an attack. Uh, they did get a little bit of data, but it was very constrained. It was limited what they got. Then they issued their typical periodic re financial report, their 10Q, and said, you know, if we were subject to an attack that did access personally identifiable information for our donors and, ve and, and uh, vendor community, that would have a significant impact potentially on our, on our ability to um, attract new customers and to stay uh, at the same level of profits. And they offered a lot of other kind of, or several other warnings in the hypothetical. If we were to suffer these consequences, here are some of the things that would then result. And we brought a case against them because they had suffered those consequences already. They just had a breakdown internally in communication between those folks who are in charge of doing the analysis of intrusions and the consequences of those intrusions, and the people at the top who are in charge of providing disclosures out to their investors. Those two sides aren't talking. You're going to have an information breakdown, and you're going to give information out to investors that is not accurate, and that's going to cost people money because they're not going to be able to accurately price for risk. So we brought an enforcement action. We held them accountable, and they settled with us, they paid a penalty, they instituted new policies and procedures, and they basically, you know, we alleged you didn't follow your policies and procedures, you didn't 
have adequate disclosure process in place to make sure your investors got timely and accurate information, and that caused harm. And is that, um, that approach, you know, brought an enforcement action? I mean, those are, you know, uh, words that bring chills to everybody's uh, minds. The, um, the notion, the, the allegation that is very frequently cited is that the SEC engages in regulation by enforcement that rather than helping firms understand what the rules of the road are, the, the analogy I've often used, and I'm sure you've heard me say this, that um, we don't know what the speed limit is until after we get pulled over for speeding. Um, is that the approach that the SEC is, is consciously, deliberately choosing to take, or is that a byproduct of the way it's working? Or, you know, this is a very frustrating element for the financial services industry, not just in the field of crypto, particularly in crypto, but it's happening uh, broadly in, in the advisory field. Talk about this philosophical approach. I, I will restrict my comments to crypto, though acknowledge they may exist well beyond it. It's just beyond my kind of level of expertise, and I've tried to stay as much over my skis as possible. Um, I don't think that what I do or the people that I lead engage in is regula regulation by enforcement. I've, I've often heard the criticism when we wake up and go to the office every day, it is about enforcing regulations. It is about, we have rules on the books that have existed since the 1940s. We regularly, I'm out speaking regularly. We have published guidance on this in 2017 and 2019 and since. We set, stood up an entire office called our uh, Strategic Office for Financial Innovation, it's the FinHub, where people can come and consult with us and ask questions and say, what if I tweak this? What if I do it this way? Our offices of corporation finance and trading and markets and investment management regularly take consultations in from people who have questions about, like, how can I do this the right way? The things that I see from the professionals that I interact with is a sincere effort to try and provide guidance where we can, but we are also constrained in that we can't, we're not your lawyers. It would be inappropriate for us to give you legal advice. And so that puts us in a bit of a, con a constraint as, as the people who are coming to talk to us are. Like you have to hire attorneys. We are a, an agency of attorneys and accountants and other professionals. And then we have to try and have a dialogue that's productive, but we can't tell you what the law is because that's just not our role. Our, well, our how do you respond to Coinbase's complaint that they have met with the SEC dozens of times, more than 30, asking the question, what are, which coins are securities, not getting answers, and instead getting an enforcement action? I'm not sure that that is, uh, with respect, I'm not sure that is exactly an accurate retelling of what they've said. Okay. Like I'm a little reluctant to get too involved in what Coinbase has alleged because we are actively litigating against Coinbase. And so I don't, again, want to try and preserve those and conversations versa. between the lawyers and, and, the, and the judge and less about what I personally think about these things. But I will say they have, Coinbase has publicly said we had more than 30 engagements with the SEC, but we didn't get any process. And like for me, as somebody who actually attends not necessarily those meetings, but every meeting I attend is process. And if I attend 30 meetings with somebody, that seems like a lot of process. And to the extent that you don't get the answer you're looking for, like those discussions don't prove to get you what it is you want, which is presumably a clean bill of health, that may say more about the conduct you're engaged in than about the other side's willingness to engage in the conversation. The implication of litigation. Um, Grayscale's got a lawsuit with the SEC. Coinbase is engaged in a couple of lawsuits. Uh, one they have filed against the SEC and now the enforcement action. Brian Armstrong, CEO of Coinbase, says they're going to fight uh, this enforcement action. The courts, as you've mentioned, is how we adjudicate and resolve these uh, differences. Uh, the downside is that this is time consuming. What's your prediction regarding how long it will take to resolve these disputes? I uh, can't come soon enough from my perspective, but uh, it's not something we, can, we control. The courts have their own schedules. These are complicated matters, and they're matters of significant import. Like the, the We're talking years. It is likely years. And in the meantime, what do you suppose um, the crypto is the impact on the crypto community, on the investment community, um, in the world of crypto, 
as a result of, you know, between now and, and those conclusions ultimately reached? What, what, what do we do? I mean, what I hope happens, and this is kind of my own pie-eyed optimism, and I'm not sure how much it's shared by industry or others, is that people say, this is the window. Like, now we have an opportunity to come in and spend the time to consult with the SEC and try and do things the right way and distinguish ourselves as the, and this hypothetical entity, I'm not saying any, any one person is pursuing this or any entity is pursuing it, but if it were me, it seems like there is a window of opportunity to say, for the next year, I can work really hard about developing a compliant marketplace that, that will look after the interests of investors, that is focused on preventing and uh, identifying market manipulation and scams and frauds, and that is going to be some place that moms and dads and lawyers and teachers and cops and principals feel comfortable they can invest their money without becoming the victim of a fraud. And I don't know that any entity that exists outside the regulatory envelope over the long term is going to be able to provide that level of confidence. And I think without that level of confidence, the digital assets marketplace, the overall market cap within the US is always gonna be smaller than it otherwise could be. I think that there is room for a compliant player and I think that there is profits to be had if people are willing to go that route. If I interpret what you just said correctly, uh, once this regulatory clarity, uh, the resolution of the court cases, et cetera, are obtained, that the uh, crypto marketplace will grow? I think it's possible. I, we, I, I don't know. My, that is my hope, is that by making it more expensive to be non-compliant than it is to follow the rules, more people will follow the rules. And the more people that follow the rules, the more people will be willing to engage, and the more people who are willing to engage will result in the uh, growth of the marketplace. I think that possibility certainly exists. Um, that sounds to me like you're bullish about crypto. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm bullish about the technology. I am agnostic and um, admittedly unclear on what it exactly is going to look like. I mean, I think it is changed. But it's here to stay. I think it's here to stay. Uh, do you personally own Bitcoin? I don't. I've never owned a crypto. I've uh, worked closely with people. I've taken multiple courses on it. I've uh, watched other people engage with it. But for me, there was a, a fraud case I brought back in 2018 on the same day that a bunch of other things happened and the price of Bitcoin fell dramatically, even though the case I was handling wasn't directly about Bitcoin. And I would never want to be in a position where People think that I'm taking an action or not taking an action because of my own personal financial interests, and so I've just stayed out of crypto entirely. After you leave uh, the SEC uh, and return to the private sector, assuming, you know, we'll, we'll just leave it at leaving the SEC or, or the role of you know, this potential conflict, I appreciate you're very much avoiding such a conflict. Too many members of Congress uh, and other government agencies in the news have failed to uh, adhere to that, uh, that principle. Thank you for doing that. But once you are no longer in such a conflicted position, will you own Bitcoin? It's a good question. I've not actually thought of that. Uh, I don't have a principled objection to it. I think it will depend on uh, my own analysis and the analysis of my financial advisor at the time as to the, 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 the likely return and success of that investment. And if you are in need of a financial advisor, I don't think there's anyone in this room willing to take you on as a client. Um, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, give our thanks to David Hirsch for joining us today. That's Dave Hirsch, Chief of the Crypto Asset and Cyber Unit in the Enforcement Division at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, on stage with me this past week at the 5th Annual DACFP Vision Conference in Austin. In coming weeks here on The Truth About Your Future, I'll be presenting you with additional conversations from the conference, including next week, the conversation I had with Congressman French Hill, chair of the House Subcommittee on Digital Assets. Right now, you can check out the photos of the conference and other highlights. It's all on my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. The links are in the show notes. Meet Schwab Intelligent Income, a simple, modern way to pay yourself from your portfolio. Overcome the complexity of income needs in retirement with automated tax smart withdrawals that you can start, stop, or adjust at any time without penalty, plus ongoing monitoring so you'll always know where you stand. 
And since lower fees means more money for you to invest, you pay no advisory fee. Available with Schwab Intelligent Portfolios. Visit schwab.com slash intelligent income, a modern approach to wealth management. You know, people used to tell me that their favorite part of this podcast was the visit by my wife, Jean. Well, her podcast has gotten so popular, she now has her own website. Selfcarewithjean.com. Every Thursday, she launches her new podcast and video cast. You can get this week's right now at selfcarewithjean.com. And you can sign up for her free email updates. You can subscribe to her social media channels. Link in the show notes. That way you'll be the first to know about everything that Jean is doing. Hey, if you like what you're hearing, be sure to follow and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, follow and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Have a great weekend. We're taking Monday off. See you on Tuesday. The truth about your future with Rick Edelman has been brought to you by Global X ETFs, dedicated to providing investors with unexplored intelligent solutions, and by Invesco QQQ. Anyone can become an agent of innovation with Invesco QQQ, Invesco Distributors, Inc. Get the truth about your future with Rick Edelman. It's the truthayf.com.